Welcome, Jennifer and David, to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm so excited to have both of you here with me today. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Yeah, thanks for having us. So this is like a dual purpose interview. The two of you, this power couple who now I know like the most intimate details of your, of your life because of Jennifer's <laughs> book. I'm like almost embarrassed. It's called, the book is called We Need to Talk, a Memoir About Wealth. But it's really also a memoir about you and it's about your success in life and how things have developed in your relationship and family and struggling with everything from am I spoiling my daughter by going to Hawaii when she's eight months old to all these like big and small questions in life. And then David is here, A, is your husband and like the central character in this book, aside from you. And also um, because he's doing such amazing things as you both are uh, for reading worldwide. So anyway, lots to discuss. <laughs> um, so why don't we start with the book? Um, Jennifer, would you mind just telling listeners who aren't aware and who might not have gotten the full scoop from my brief summary there, what your book is about and also what made you write this book? What made you write it and why now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Zibi, I'm really lucky because when I was 25, I joined Microsoft and I met David. <laughs> and I also got stock that ended up being worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you know, six years later, Dave and I were married, um, expecting our first child. And David started this job at an unknown startup that was selling books on the internet because he loves books. And he wanted to try this thing out. And it was Amazon. <laughs> and we were in our early 30s and we had more money than we could wrap our heads around. And, you know, wealth surprised me. I didn't find myself in a big sparkly private club hanging out and sharing financial secrets. I found myself kind of alone in a strange, silent space where no one talks much about money at all. You know, I felt the resentment of friends. I was worried about raising spoiled, entitled children. I wasn't sure how to give to family members or how to approach philanthropy. You know, no one discusses these things, even though most people are new to these challenges. Eight out of 10 people with wealth grew up middle class or poor. So, you know, I was surprised that wealth felt so isolating because normally, you know, if I have a problem or a question, I turn to friends. I, if I want to figure out, should my 16 year old have a curfew? I ask everyone I know. Like, I get their ideas, I hear about their experiences, I get advice. And just talking about something like that is, is, is helpful because it lets me know, you know, my question is normal, that it's shared. Um, but the same doesn't happen with money. And I couldn't talk to people about having a lot of it. Uh, so, you know, I thought, oh, I'll turn to books. And I wanted to find a book, but there were no books. It's like, where is the bookshelf for people who have won the lottery? <laughs> <laughs> I can't I find the book about this. <laughs> and I needed that book. And actually, you know, I wrote my book um, because my story is one I'd want to know about if it hadn't happened to me. Um, but I also wrote my book for the millions of Americans like me who have more money than they had growing up or they have more money than many of their friends, or they have more money than others in their extended family. I'm, I'm sharing my story as a way to help other people understand their own, because we have this sort of fairy tale idea about wealth in our heads. The reality feels strange and, and lonely. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, trying to show people how to do rich right. I, I don't have the answer for that, but I am offering up this story that hasn't been told. That I, feel, I, I feel like you came in also, sorry, I, I hope I didn't interrupt you, but you came in with this bias. I mean, I feel like your family was particularly not anti-wealthy, but just like, you know, there was such a judgment attached to spending anything. Like, I feel like you had such a chip on your shoulder. Like maybe not yeah. everyone coming into wealth is that... Um, almost disdainful of it, um, or like I can't enjoy this house, or I can't, you know, you, you know get a connecting flight or whatever it was, right? Uh, right, or a right. No, airport, or you know, you. I feel like you had a particularly strong background against it. Um, yeah. And then when you when you like found yourself in it, you had to 
do a lot of mental work to kind of, you know, it's like cognitive dissonance in a way, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think, you know, I, to become something that you're biased against yes. is tricky. So I had to really work through that. But I do think that we have a very narrow and incomplete view of wealth in our country. Um, we see the stereotypes, you know, we know the Kardashians and the real housewives and the men of Wolf of Wall Street. And of course, we've heard of Jeffrey Epstein or the parents who illegally try to get their kids into to schools that they're not qualified for. So we see these stereotypes. So I don't think I'm the only one who kind of has this view of what wealth is all about. I mean, it doesn't look or feel like what Hollywood sells us. And, and you know, eight out of 10, like I said, people with wealth grew up middle class or poor, so they are you. Right. And I feel like so many people would be like, really? Okay, so it's hard for you to be suddenly wealthy. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> you know, right. And that's why you can't get like a normal conversation going about it because it's something that people would really like to have, yeah. you know, even I if there's a bias, right? So it's hard to... It, you know, it's a woe is me problem. It's like, woe is me. Should I go to Aspen or not? You know, right? <laughs> these are the tough que- These are the tough questions. That, you know, so I think people are very quick to mock it and um, not understand it, and um, uh, and then they're they're left a big hole for your book. So there you go. <laughs> well, I think there's a reason this book hasn't been written. It's because of that, and um, I think it's important to start conversations because you know no matter how much you have in your bank account, if you have parents, if you have a partner or siblings or friends, you probably know that money is uncomfortable to talk about. You probably have faced sort of that awkward money moment or you have some money issue sort of hanging over your head. And, you know, it's emotional. And these emotions are universal. You know, no matter how much you have, you, you, we have a lot of fear it's fear of being rejected, fear of uh, hurting other people's feelings, fear of not measuring up or of sounding unknowledgeable. You know, we all have money shame and money guilt. And we all have that money story that starts in childhood. David, I don't want to leave you out here. Um, I have all of Jen's, um, you know, views of her family and her wealth and all this stuff and some of yours, but what was this whole experience like for you? Like, are you, do you share the, let's talk about it. Let's let other people in like mission of Jennifer's right now, or how do you feel? (laughs) Uh, For sure. The answer is yes to that question. I do. Um, But yeah, I mean, my growing up was different and uh, I didn't grow up with a lot of money myself. In fact, I was raised by a single mother. And, and for me, um, and, and our sort of big event for the week was going to the library and coming home with a big stack of books. Like that was sort of, that's how we sort of explored the world. So in, in which obviously has something to do with what I'm, what I'm uh, doing now. But, you know, so for me, there's probably less emotion in a sense tied up. You know, my mother, my, what my mother would say is, uh, we're not poor, we just don't have any money. And so it's just kind of like a, a sort of a neutral statement. So I didn't have that sort of you know, kind of bias coming in. At the same time, I had no preparation for what we've gone through at all, at all. And, uh, you know, as Jen said, I mean, this is the book I would have looked for in the bookstore if, if it existed, but instead, you know, she had to write it. Wow. Um, and by the way, I used to work at a company called Idea Lab. I don't know if you knew it. It was like a big deal in like 2001 for like a, a hot minute. So I had a moment with stock options because I was one of the, I was like the 25th employee. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to have this huge pile fall into my lap. Anyway, it didn't happen. But anyway, I know uh, when you were saying how people had the stock price, you know, uh, in the office, sort of like checking all the time. That was sort of became the culture of, of some of the operating companies. So anyway, I don't even know why I bothered sharing that. Uh, um, I want to hear about um, the new nonprofit and half my DAP and all these things that you guys are doing to like change the world, um, world reader and like everything. So how, when did all this, when did the nonprofit element giving back sort of start, you know, bubbling up in your lives and how did it come to this? I mean, it's something we can probably both talk about and we have, you know, maybe a little bit different perspective. Neither one of us really grew up in a family that gave a lot of money away. We didn't have any money to give away. Uh, Jen's parents weren't really really wired that way. 
And so for us, I mean, Jen talks about this, you know, sort of our first sort of philanthropy, I guess, was sort of, you know, the, our, our children's school asking us for donations and, and you know, these sorts of things, which, um, which looking back on it are, are sort of fine on ramps, but they're, it, it's kind of incrementalism. You know, it's not really going to kind of get you, get you over the, over the, um, the, the, the sort of hump. Um, years ago, about 10 years ago, we decided to spend the year traveling around the world with our uh, children, with our two daughters. We have two daughters. And at the time, they were very young, and we were their teachers, which is a whole separate experience, and <laughs> just infuriating and fantastic and everything you can imagine. But, um, but we also spent every afternoon and, and often you know, entire days or, or, or longer uh, working with them, um, doing kind of service work. You know, we, would, we taught at a school in China for a couple of weeks, taught English there. We helped paint a house and actually helped them buy a house in Vietnam and so forth. Along the way, we were reading. And again, that's a sort of separate story about, about World Reader. But, but I think both of us at that point were sort of looking for, you know, kind of a little bit of the next thing. And, and I, in particular, was very much looking for the next thing. I'd been at Amazon for many years. And so, again, I can tell you the story at the beginning of Amazon separately, if you're interested. But for us, at least sure, for me. I, I would take that. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you got it. No, finish this one. Finish this one. Ah, so, um, you know, uh, I, I, maybe I'll tell you just sort of the beginning of World Reader, which will kind of help tie a couple of threads together. So we actually ended the, uh, the trip in Ecuador. And we were at an orphanage. And as we're walking, as a girls' orphanage, and our daughters had volunteered, and we had spent the day kind of working with the, with the young women there. As we were walking towards the exit of the orphanage, the woman who ran the orphanage uh, was kind of looking around. And I was too. And I saw a building with a big padlock on and I asked the woman, what's going on with that? And she said, well, you know, that's our library. So here, okay, my ears are perking up, right? So, because I'm the library kid, right? That was, I wasn't good at a lot as, as a kid, but I could, you know, I, I knew something about the library. So anyway, uh, I said, well, why is it locked? And she said, look, the books take forever to get here. They come by boat. Often by the time they get here, they're not very interesting because they're out of date, or maybe they started out as being someone else's kind of almost trash books type of thing. So the, the girls just aren't very interested in that anymore. And uh, I said, you know, well, gosh, that doesn't sound good at all. Can we take a look inside? And she said, you know, I think I've lost the key to that place. And when she said that, and when, you know, now we're looking at our two daughters and each of our daughters has a Kindle because, you know, of my Amazon background and we'd use that to read around the world. You know, every place we went, we'd read books that were local books and so forth. I just said, this is, this is crazy. So, you know, one thing led to another and, uh, and we started World Reader with this notion that, you know, everyone can be a reader. You know, readers build a better future. Uh, they're healthier, they're more prosperous, more empathy. And if we can get a billion people reading someday, this world will, will be a better place. That's been what I've been focused on these last 10 years, just as Jen has been focused on for 14 years, writing this book about money and philanthropy and sort of doing more in the world. And so it's been a really interesting, you know, kind of both parallel path, but then paths which keep kind of crossing in all sorts of fun ways. You must have really great, inspiring conversations at the dinner table <laughs> about what you guys have been doing during the day. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, well, insider look at the formation of Amazon. I'll take a, a snippet of that if you're, if you're offering it. <laughs> For sure. I mean, all I can say there is, you know, I, I was the 30th, so you were the, the 50th employee. 25th. 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 Oh, my God. Okay, so, so you know what it's like to be part of a company that's still figuring out what it's all about. I was number 37 at Amazon. And at the time, it was a tiny, as Jen said, a tiny little internet bookstore. We had sold $15.6 million of books in 1996. Uh, and in 1997, after some conversations with this sort of crazy guy named Jeff Bezos, who actually literally called me one day, checking the reference of someone who used to work with me uh, when I was at Microsoft. Um, anyway, joining this company, he had this just huge vision of, I want to be the place you can find and discover anything you want to buy on the internet. That was kind of his early vision. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll get to a billion dollars by 2000. And I just said, look, how can I not do this? It's technology, which I've grown to love at Microsoft. It's uh, books because it was a bookstore and we could, we could become Earth's biggest bookstore. That was our tagline at the time. And we could maybe do something that really did uh, kind of changed the world. But it was exhausting and crazy. And, and frankly, we didn't know what we were doing half the time. I mean, we almost ran out of money a couple of times. There were, again, it's, it's, a, it's probably a whole separate podcast. But all I can say is that from the outside today, Amazon looks like this incredible machine. But I will tell you, when you're employee number 37, and you're literally putting down the train tracks as the train is just barreling down the, the, um, the, the, the tracks, it's, um, it's, it's pretty frightening. Last thing I'll say, my mother would, <laughs> she would, she would call me. And she would say, look, David, what have you done? Why have you left Microsoft to go to this crazy thing? 
And in the, the papers, we'd be calling this Amazon.bomb, right? That was the sort of uh, thing. So anyway, no one knew what the heck, uh, why I'd made this crazy decision. But I just said, look, it was kind of about books, kind of about reading, and kind of a, almost a passion book for me to see if this was going to work. And luckily, it, um, it did. And at that time, you know, people weren't going to their computers to buy things. And I was like, oh, my gosh, who's going to go to the computer to buy a book? And then he was going to add music, and he was going to add toys. I'm like, no one is going to go to their computer. <laughs> No. Luckily, someone else had a better vision than I did. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, Jen was a huge advocate of my going. We had also just had our, just about to have our first daughter. So it was kind of crazy. People would say, maybe you should just have one child at once, like not have a child <laughs> right. and a couple. But anyway, it worked up. It worked up. <laughs> wow. Um, that's nuts. <laughs> what a story. <laughs> I feel like, though, the startup life and the parenting life, I mean, you're probably up at all hours in both cases. So it must have mm. sort of you know, <laughs> been a nice... Like, uh, <laughs> Years, yeah, biotic the, relationship. Right, those were the sleep. Neither one of us slept for about you know seven years. Yeah, who needs sleep? I mean, no, nobody needs sleep. Um, Jen, in your book, I found it really interesting that interspersed with all of the personal stories and sort of the thought-provoking issues you brought up, you had little pages with like discussion questions, as if you wanted us to stop and like literally like. Um, I, I thought I should find, yeah, like little conversation starters, like, all right, I better stop and I don't know, talk to my husband about what, uh, <laughs> what Emily's, uh, what, sh what about the parents at Emily's new independent school? Uh, what are they doing with each other and all the rest? Tell me about putting in the questions at each chapter and not even like bullet points, which I feel like other books do, but like almost like reading, you know, book club questions as you go. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think that this is a, I do want it to be a conversation starter and get people talking about money. I mean, I think, you know, I talk about private school auctions and private jets and I talk about the luxuries money can buy, but I also really take a look at the, the human aspects and the emotions that arise. So even though the specifics might be different for people, I think people can relate to my stories and I'm hoping that they can kind of understand their own in a new way. And those questions really are, prompts to get people to, I mean, I can see like you reading it with your husband or giving it to your parents or giving it to your sibling or giving it to a, a good friend. And that is, then it becomes sort of the catalyst for conversation that it makes it easier to start those conversations. So I'd love to pe for people to use those questions, not only to kind of think about for themselves, but to share and start these money conversations that are so needed start them happening. I mean, I think my book is like the ideal book club book. I mean, for people who want it, it's, it's not easy. I, I always tell people this is really, really uncomfortable. And so I'm, I'm sort of inviting people to get uncomfortable. And it, in a book club, for example, it could be like, let's acknowledge, let's give each other permission to fumble around, to get it wrong, to, to get messy, you know, that's what we're going to be doing together. And I think if you can create that safe space, it really can bring people closer. I think on the other side of those sort of fears is a real connection, a sense of relief, and then a chance to really learn from each other and collaborate. I have to put you in touch with, have you heard of Emmanuel Acho? Um, he started something called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, and he's doing all of that about race. Um, and now he has a book coming out, I think this week, um, that Oprah is helping publish, and he's like a big deal. He's only like 29, so, you know. Oh, wow, wow. I know, I know, I know, I know. So let's put, <laughs> that, as, let's put that annoying fact aside. Um, <laughs> but he, he, he literally was saying the same thing. You need to feel a little uncomfortable. You have to have a conversation that gets you out of your comfort zone, and that's how we make change. Um, you're doing it about wealth and he's doing yeah. that race. But yeah. gosh, now we need somebody about like uncomfortable gender conversations. Yeah. That I can <laughs> panel <Yeah>. on. <laughs> totally. That's a great idea. There's not uh, a lot of examples of people growing without a little discomfort at some point. You know, yes. they're, they're, just, they're just aren't. And that's what Jen's really trying to do is push you into that zone. And then hopefully on the other side, there's a better connection. It's like working out, right? It's like it doesn't feel good necessarily, but you know, if you afterwards, ever, afterwards, afterwards you feel, I mean, sometimes, although as I like hobble around today, sometimes <laughs> you feel better. Um, what did the two of you think about how much anti-wealth sentiment there is in the United States right now? I feel like being wealthy is like the worst thing you could possibly be. And you know, it, so many, even politicians and everybody want to sort of take wealth away and redistribute it. How, what, what is your view on all that? Well, I do think it's a huge problem. I think maybe it's 
the biggest problem our country is facing, this disparity. And yeah, there's a lot of resentment. And um, I don't think the resentment helps anyone. It doesn't help those who feel it or the people on the other side. I mean, when there's a huge and influential segment of the population that isn't talking to each other, right, and who feels attacked by this or, you know, and isolated, it's not making them empathetic or generous. So, you know, we need to kind of start closing this gap. I mean, our silence um, creates a lot, it has a lot of power. It, it helps kind of keep the status quo in place. So I'm hoping to get conversations going that can kind of shake things up, um, help us recognize our own privilege in a new way, help us feel more accountable through conversation, help us collaborate. I mean, we have, have the power to do amazing things and help bring this country together. It's what we need right now is to be united and to shy away from the, the, the resentment and the, and the huge disparity, I think, is not a service to anyone. I mean, yeah, there's, there's people are going without housing, without health care, without food. There's an education crisis. I mean, we, this is the moment that we need to face this. And if we're just going to turn our back or pretend it doesn't exist or, or kind of accept it, that's, that's not okay with me. <laughs> yeah. I was just add super quickly. I, I uh, just like growth doesn't come with without some vulnerability and, and awkwardness. I, I don't think change comes through shame. It doesn't work, and so that's that's not helpful. It, it to as a country, it just doesn't. It just doesn't. It just doesn't work. Hmm. What do you think about the fact that so many of the people? Well, no, I shouldn't say so many. See, I'm having an uncomfortable conversation in my own head. What mm. do you think about the fact that um, if given the choice and you said, do you want a million dollars? Most people would be like, sure, hand it over, right? And yet, um, at, at, so they're like talking on one side about how they it shouldn't be that way. But if, it, if they were to have that happen to them, they would gratefully accept it perhaps. And the role, I mean, not to get too political, but, you know, Obviously, there are societal issues, but is it whose job is it to redistribute that wealth? Like, is it from the individual or is it from the government? I don't know. What I, do you think? I mean, I think philanthropy is wonderful, and I think we should all be kind of feeling that responsibility. But we can't. I mean, there's it's a drop in the bucket compared to what needs to happen, and it needs to happen at a governmental level, policy level. Uh, yeah, we need you know healthcare for all. We need to ensure that there's a, a strong social safety net. For, for people in this country. We, I don't want to live in a society where people are living on the street. That's a disaster to me. We need, we need a huge structural change and I'm very thankful for our new leaders. <laughs> me too, very excited. It's like such a fun word. Uh, I'll air this later, but we're talking now right after this historic, exciting weekend. I feel like I've been like bouncing around my house or something today. <laughs> just Absolutely. so much optimism right now. So much excitement. I'm so ready for it. Um, which is great. Um, uh, wait, there was something I wanted to ask about um, wealth. Oh, I wanted to know how you're handling your daughters at this point. So in order to not spoil them, like today, like what is, what is your approach to parenting without spoiling? Yeah. What, what, are, what are the rules? What are the, you know? <laughs> right. Well, the groundwork's already been laid. I mean, I think it happens early. Um, and I don't think it's like a conversation. It's, it's living your values day to day, week to week, you know, they, they're watching you. So kids see how you interact with other people. They see kind of how you make decisions, what you prioritize. So I think, you know, it's even just having, thinking about going into the grocery store with your, with your kids. Um, what do you do when someone cuts you off and takes the parking spot? How do you react? Like, are you deserving of that parking spot? Or do you kind of accept like, well, maybe they're in, in a rush. Let's find another one. It's okay. And going into the grocery store, is a, it's an opportunity to show your values, to talk about you know, are you choosing things because of, you know, the value they have or the price or how do you make decisions? How do you make choices? And that's a, an opportunity to, for teaching your kids too. You know, when you go to the meat counter, how do you interact with a man on the other side? Are you gracious? Are you thankful? Um, same with checking out. I mean, I think all these small details add up. And I think that's what kids really, really learn, how they learn is through watching us. And I think it's about not only values, but sort of our attitude, 
Um, a sense of gratitude, I think, is really important. I mean, even if you're traveling to to amazing places, if you if you don't take things for granted, if you show appreciation, I mean, I think all these things are important. I think you need to walk the walk, and and your kids will will learn from that. And how about um, entrepreneurial ways versus not? Are you trying to imbue that as something that's like, I mean, maybe just by modeling your kids absorb this and, you know, being a Silicon Valley family, perhaps it's just goes without saying, but um, what do you, what do you think about entrepreneurship in the family? Well, I, I want both of our daughters to find themselves and follow their own path and figure out what's right for them. I mean, yeah, we were modeling what's right for each of us and as a couple, but now they're, you know, they're in their early 20s. This is their moment to find their own path and find their own passions and find out where, where they can make their impact and difference in the world. So um, I want to support them to be their best selves. I also just <laughs> putting my own two cents in to your parenting. I think that even though they're in their 20s, there's still a lot to be of parenting left in terms of, oh yeah, <laughs> especially in terms of the financial side of life, because this is when, like, I think back to my twenties and like, I feel like my parents were okay, she's good. Well, she's good. You know, like she knows and she, you know, we can't spoil her and you know, she's off on her own, but you know, I don't know. I don't think the twenties yeah. you're, I, you know, this is really my forties. I'm like ready to go. <laughs> I don't think I was in my twenties necessarily. No. And I realize this more and more. And especially this is where the wealth gets layered on. I'm reading a, a really wonderful book um, by James Grubman called strangers in paradise. And it really talks about kind of, you know, the, the stereotypes of wealth and then the, the kind of attitudes that we both brought to wealth, which is middle-class attitudes. And, and those served us well, but, but now we have to think about how to use our wealth in society and with our kids. And, and it's more inclusive, it's more interdependent, and it's starting those conversations. And we have started to have kind of family conversations and, and kind of talk about our values and our mission as a family who has this incredible resource um, and how do we how do we make sure we harness that for good in in the world and that our children buy into the philosophy that that we're doing this as a family and that is a piece that I'm we're it's in process right now I mean it, so it's yeah it's a big question and I think a big question for anyone who's kind of come into more money than they had growing up you know the the big worry of course is initially like how am I am I going to spoil my kids are they going to be entitled are they going to be ambitious and motivated and I feel like we've checked that box but then there's this whole new kind of how are they going to be as as people as stewards of of wealth in the world I, one of the things that um I think in, sometimes it's just better to be lucky than smart, right? So the fact that we started World Reader 10 years ago has given our, which at that point they were in fourth and sixth grade, right? So, or fifth and seventh grade. So they were young at the time. I think that's right. And so they've had 10 years to sort of watch, um, you know, sort of how to steward, not just the wealth side, but kind of how you spend your life side of things. And I, one of the things sometimes people ask me about, you know, philanthropy and, and, and you know, rolling up your sleeves and starting a nonprofit. And, 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 and I, my, my basic advice is, you know, do it and do it earlier than you think you should. You know what I mean? Just kind of get into it because it does set an example. First of all, it takes some time to get halfway good at it. You know, here we are 10 years later and it still feels like a work in process for, uh, you know, for me at least. But, but also it gives your kids and your whole family a way to sort of experience it over a long period of time. And I think as Jen was saying, it's not just about that. People want to want to diminish these sorts of things as a as a, a one conversation. You know, what does the talk look like with your kids about money or something? It's not like that. It's years of experience and watching and absorbing. And and I agree. Our older daughter actually was just up here for dinner a couple of weeks or a couple of days ago, and she actually brought up wealth herself and the relationship that she has with her boyfriend and so forth. It's and she's twenty three, so it's still happening. Yeah, that's like a whole other thing. That's another mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, so what advice would you both have, both to aspiring authors having written this book? And I'm sorry we didn't talk a lot about your process and I'm interested in all that, but I guess, I don't know, next podcast. Um, yeah. uh, advice to aspiring authors and then advice to people who really want to use their wealth for good, both. Yeah. Well, aspiring authors have a lot of tenacity. <laughs> Keep going. I mean, I think 
I really enjoyed the process of writing. I found it fascinating. It's like a puzzle. Like, how was I going to piece all these pieces together? And how was I going to talk about money in a way that wasn't off-putting or offensive? So those, I had those pieces to kind of wrestle with. Um, and I've been rejected so many times. I think it's, you know, believing in yourself, believing in the process, and just keep going, and you can do it. Um, I and, and I really it, it took me <laughs> like many many years, um, so I'm very happy to have it out in the world. Yeah. And on the um, sort of putting money to work for good, I would say it, it really starts with looking in the mirror, and and thinking to yourself, what do I what do I really care about? You know, it's so, it's so easy to get confused. You know, people ask you, particularly if you have money, even if you don't have money, people ask you for things all the time. And you have to remember that there's a difference sometimes between what they want and what, what you want. If it comes to doing the, this sort of work, I mean, World Reader now, as they say, we're 10 years old. We've, we've reached 15 million kids. You know, we're using technology and local books all around the world. Actually, today, this is fun. I know the podcast will air in the future, but uh, today... Monday, November 9th, is the day we're announcing that after 10 years, we're finally bringing our program to the United States um, to help vulnerable communities here in the United States. That's going to have huge ripple effects on the organization. So it's hard work. It's hard. Running a nonprofit is not easy and, and, and sort of doing good in the world, whatever that looks like for you. These are big problems, right? The problem of literacy, the problem of the environment, the problem of pick your favorite. And so, so you better care about it a lot because if you don't care about it a lot, you'll give up too fast. And if you give up too fast, you'll get nothing done. That is true. <laughs> Nobody ever won the race. They didn't, they didn't go on, right? Or whatever that yeah. expression is. Anyway. Um, well, thank you both so much. And I really appreciated hearing your story from, you know, the proposal at dinner to, like, to now. So thanks for letting the rest of the world in on, on your lives and um, trying to help others in the many ways you do. And if people want to support World Reader, David, how would they do that? They go to worldreader.org, worldreader.org on your, on your phone or on your uh, computer and um, come on in and take a look at what we're doing. We'd love to have all the support we can get. It's the only way we're able to do our work. Amazing. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Zibby. you, Zibby. Really Super enjoyed fun. it. Yeah, thanks. And they'll send all the lottery winners uh, your way. You should just put it in the like convenience stores, you know, if you win. Here's <laughs> the, the, the ticket. <laughs> yeah, the ticket. Anyway, just a thought, marketing opportunity. Okay, bye. <laughs>